Oh shit, I'm here. Hang on, we're doing this. Sorry, I was in the bathroom. Welcome to SCP Cafe. This is the 2019 Week 48 Recap Show. I'm your host, Blue Soul, SCP Wiki moderator, chat administrator, author, loving husband, dog petter, clone aficionado, Tottenham Hotspur supporter. Let's get down to business. I have been off work for the better part of two weeks now. It has not really gone the way that I envisioned it would. Um, what I was hoping for was uh, this, taking the time to recharge, become more excited in my work uh, with the wiki, with the show. Um, that hasn't really transpired. Um, what's happened has felt more like, um, well, it's it's been more like depression. Um, and I think part of it may be jumping into a long break without any real structure and then feeling bad when you don't hit those unspecified goals. And that's kind of a dick move to do to yourself, uh, to, you know, be mad at yourself for not doing things you didn't know you were going to be mad at yourself for not doing um, it's not a great system, um, and it, it's not been it's not been a great time. Um, mental health is so important for you know uh, for everything. You can't function without you know you can't take care of your family. You can't do much without um, being in solid mental footing. You can't take care of yourself. There's a psychological theory called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and it basically postulates that you have important needs that are at the base of a a sort of a pyramid, and those are your survival uh, level things, food, shelter, uh, you know, the, the very basics of survival. And once you've once you feel secure that you've taken care of those things, the next step above that is, um, feeling safe, having, you know, a a gainful job, having good health, personal security, uh, above that is your family, your friends, um, taking care of, of those people. And beyond that is your self esteem, feeling self-respect and, you know, feeling strong and independent and able to, uh, able to be your own person. And then at the top of that pyramid is the concept of self-actualization. Um, the thought that you can, uh, be the most that you can be. And that is where creative endeavors are made. That's where, uh, people are at their most um, capable um, when you try to create and you're not at that level. Um, you you can tell um, it's generally not going to be your best work. I think having an open conversation about these things is important. Um, I believe there is still a lot of stigma uh, about depression and whether it's, you know, uh, like a trauma inflicted thing or seasonally affected, which I think I have some of that going on. This is like my least favorite time of year. Um, but you know, through this combination of things, I am realizing I'm feeling fairly burnt out. Um, I'm not deriving any joy from the process and that's unfortunate. Um, but it is something I currently feel obligated to continue doing. And this is not really the best balance of things. Uh, you know, when you're doing it because you feel you must do it, it starts to feel an awful lot like work and it's hard to get 
a good quality production out of uh, feeling obligated. So looking forward, I haven't made any concrete decisions. Um, I'm going to wait until my new job starts and uh, reevaluate then. Um, my time may be greatly constricted after that point anyway. Um, but if nothing changes, then my plan is to uh, pause the Patreon for January. Um, I will do something in the vein of an awards show. And I will, after that, be doing something different with the show. It will not be a weekly format. Um, it will be something uh, that is on a less frequent basis, or at least a less rigorously scheduled basis. Um, it may be uh, smaller bits of content more often, because I think part of it is sitting down and trying to take on this show that is generally, you know, 80 to 100 minutes in length has become fairly daunting. Um, so perhaps it'll be something like that where, you know, I'll be reading a new article and I'll just want to talk about that one for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Um, I don't know, but I know that if it does get to that point, I am not going to be soliciting any money for the creation of it. Um, what I will likely do is pivot the Patreon to funding uh, Scuttle, the wiki backup system, and, uh, you know, architecting new solutions for the future of the SCP Foundation wiki. This isn't a farewell show, not today. Um, there's still several more weeks to get through that I really do want to get through. Um, there is a level of commitment to myself to, at the very least, see out 2019. That means going back to a couple of weeks that were not covered due to, uh, you know, the uh, family emergency and getting some more bonus content out there and doing the end of year award show. So there's still stuff in the pipeline, um, but I'm just not at this point making any commitments uh for 2020. And you know what? I'm open to suggestions. Um, if you have any ideas or, yeah, I mean, if you just want to say hello, whatever, um, feel free. You can hit me up either on the chat link on scp.cafe. You can shoot me an email, bluesoul at scp.cafe. Uh, send me a wiki.pm. There's all sorts of ways to get a hold of me. And if you have an idea for new content or ways to, you know, make this something fun and different and exciting I would uh, I would love to hear them um, I'm going to do something a little different for this show just for the sake of it um, for trying something new this show will not be as long um, we're going to talk briefly about each of the uh, the selected articles for the week and uh, it's they're not going to be full recaps um, but more of a synopsis, uh, more of the uh, long boy treatment, and a, a few thoughts on it, and we'll kind of leave it there. Um, that may, it might help. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of scraping at the walls here trying to uh, figure out what might, uh, what might help me out here. For now, let's talk week 48 and SCP-4601, Revenge of the Red Menace, which was a co-write between Nick the Brick 1 and Boogeyman 23. This was Nick the Brick's first piece. This is their debut on Cafe, obviously. Um, if you were to elevator pitch this piece, it would be um, a dialogue-heavy uh, work about a fire engine that... Uh, has the persona of sort of a grizzled New York detective uh, on the hunt for fires and uh, the king of fire, Mr. Burns. The trouble is the conspiracy may not actually go that deep and it uh, may just be, uh, you know, an anthropomorphic fire truck too. Um, 
on reading this piece, I was reminded of a few different works. Um, SCP-4494, The Spectre Fights for Justice. Um, I thought about uh, Goose Terminator back from Series 2, SCP-1675, um, where you've got sort of this uh, sentient, this sapient thing that is fighting things uh, out of some... Uh, some internal code and with it being you know a fire truck uh, this one makes a little more sense than goose terminator you've got the fire truck bursting on the scene of a popular cooking show you know driving itself through a wall to put out the fire you know from a, a grill or a you know a, a, a cooktop and dialogue between it and and the agents and the thing actually takes sort of an emotional turn at the end the thing is fairly short and it is surprising how effectively they managed to um have you sympathize with the skip by the end um this article is very much a creation of the wiki you can feel all of the different inspirations in it from you know years of of reading the site um, that said, it uh, it does strike out on its own just enough to get a plus one from me. Um, things I would have liked to have seen done a little bit differently in it. We're, uh, we're so focused on making this uh, piece where you sympathize with the skip that um, when, when it's over, we haven't actually done some of the stuff that we needed to do in an SCP, we didn't ask some of the questions that um, I'm left asking, you know, is this, we, we, we don't get into really the creation of the thing, we don't get into this, Mr. Burns, is it a POI, do we, you know, are we taking this thing at its word, we really shouldn't, um, and we don't really talk about any of that to the extent that it did catch my attention, it's like we've brought up a bunch of little things, a bunch of little uh little threads that I thought we were going to go back and pull on and then we never did. So um, when you do introduce those things, be careful to either use them or acknowledge them b b by the time you're done. Moving on, SCP-4996, The Demon, The Deal, and The Trash Can Elvis by Dyslexian um, managed to subvert my expectations of this monkey's paw sort of demonic contract almost immediately and in doing so that's a great way to hook the reader when you basically spring your twist on a formula early you have basically made it so the reader will be more engaged when uh when they see that because they want to figure out what's going on they want to find out what else is different from what they expected so we have basically this black sheep demon um that gets summoned accidentally like i think you meant to summon my dad uh, which was a great way early on to say oh okay this is uh, th nobody expected this um we have you know the usual suspects the test logs of uh, basically far more mild uh, monkey's paw catches on uh, the various requests that these people make. The piece overall is a little bit shorter than it looks because it is mostly dialogue. Um, you, you you might, uh, on reading this, you, you may be a little put out with doing this whole, like, oh, you know, it's it's the good guy demon thing. Like, it feels like a trope that we've explored pretty thoroughly, um, even just this year. So, you know, if you wanted to gripe that, you know, we've got enough of these, oh, they're just like us, oh, he thinks he's people kind of thing, um, I would understand the sentiment there. Um, but all in all, uh, dialogue's all really solid. And um, it's not like, it's not the deepest story in the world. It's basically a vehicle for uh, a couple of funny things and, you know, this sort of interesting uh, change to the format of sort of these demonic contracts. Um, I like that the uh, Tartarian-class demonic entity has been going strong for uh, a few months now since uh, 4661. I would have maybe even liked to have seen a little, uh, little cross-linking there because I feel like anything that makes use of that particular phrase is kind of living in the same shared universe. 
Um, all in all, I really like the piece. Um, it is uh, going strong at plus 75 at the time of this writing, and that is including my plus one. Moving on, SCP-2743, Sutunger Nevermore, a co-write between Dr. Akimoto and Dyslexian, um, is interesting in that it needs a fair bit of specialized knowledge to really get the full impact of the story it's trying to tell in a very compact format. Um, the knowledge in this case being uh, that of Norse mythology, which, you know, a lot of people do know uh, enough about for this to land to a certain extent. Um, the idea is that we have found four Jotun class humanoid entities, giants from uh, Norse lore, uh, ranging from two to five kilometers in length, um, dead and mangled in the rings of Saturn. The very dry clinical tone of the sighting reports, um, I think, do favors to this piece um, because it is, uh, I think what they're really going for is that sort of uh, fridge horror where on thinking of it later, it's like, God, that's really awful. Um, we don't have much of a story in it beyond that Thor is an asshole which uh, is not news, um, so I guess our news here would be the implications for this existing in our world. Um, I like the Keter classification for it because these things themselves are thoroughly dead, um, but it is the risk of being spotted. And oh, by the way, you know, they're in space in, you know, in a way that it is only going to become more likely with time that they are discovered and we have uh, no way to really move them. So the best thing we've come up with is basically to uh, discredit the first group to find these things and call it a practical joke. And while people are laughing and trying to uh, corroborate the findings, uh, basically blow up all of these corpses with thermonuclear probes that have already been placed. I like that we are doing that rather than just, you know, because in your head you're having this, like, well, why don't we just destroy it? It's like, well, because that's not what we do. So we have a tough decision to make, and I think that may have been um, something worth exploring a little bit more um, in the logistics of how do we... How do we deal with something this size, this obvious, just floating out in space? Like, um, we we have a, a good start there, and we do basically mention this, you know, does threaten a broken masquerade. So, it, it's a very short piece. It has a little poem at the end that um, basically, it, it leaves even more questions uh for the reader at the very end. So this was well done, um, really, really well done. There is a note in the little author info thing saying to stay tuned for the upcoming Ragnarok canon, which if they do that, I feel like they need to get many meets involved as uh, I originally thought this was going to end up being his work um, because of the stuff he did uh, a few months back with the uh, uh, sort of space uh, Viking war skip. That was uh, SCP-4905. It had a lot of the same feel, and uh, yeah, well, really well done. Um, for being as short as it is, get in, hit them, get out. There's some really gnarly stuff in it. Well done. Now, AIS Mallard would like to plug the tale 1914. It says it's one of the best creepypastas on the site, maintaining excellent pacing as it blurs the line between roleplay and anomalous reality. 1914 is probably my favorite tale on the wiki full stop. Um, it is absolutely outstanding. Um, it has just beautiful elements of believability in it. And I, I, I'm going to go reread it right now, actually. Um, it is absolutely not to be missed. Moving on, 
SCP-4345, titled Not Your Home, Not Your Pain, Not Yourself, by Crashington. Uh, I It's an interesting piece. It, uh, it kind of suffers from chronic subtlety, um, or perhaps I am just not at the same wavelength as this article. Um, there's something very interesting I can tell is going on, but um, I'm kind of struggling to figure out exactly what we're trying to convey, and that does seem to be sort of the, the the sentiment in the forums for the most part. There are a couple of theories, but uh, nothing that seems to have been confirmed as being what the actual message was. Um, the one thing that I thought was really cool in this piece is a little bit where we have um, basically an appeal to increase the funding of research on this skip and what we have is the O5 Council voting um, 11 against, 2 abstaining, and 0 in favor. Meanwhile, the Ethics Committee voted 25 in favor, 1 abstaining, and 3 against. So their motion passed, and the Administrator voted against it. So we basically have sort of uh, duplicated uh, sort of a uh, legislative and executive uh, system where those two were sort of uh, deadlocked and the administrator uh, pulled the trigger on not doing it. Um, the The piece is basically to do with um, sort of a mysterious pain, uh, neuropathy to be precise, uh, showing up on the body with no real cause that's discernible. We can pick up on little fluctuations in Hume levels. Um, and we have a couple of interviews with uh, one person that is sort of suffering from it. And there's some exposition in here about their past, but I can't make the connection between that and what we're talking about in the present. It feels very much like we're trying to hammer away. This is important, but I'm just, I can't, uh, I can't figure it out. I can appreciate that the pacing is very good, despite not really understanding what's going on within it. Um, it ends uh, in sort of an unexpected manner um, where where you would normally have your denouement, you have this uh, access denied, uh, which is a cool, a cool way to close out the piece, um, leaving you with a lot of those questions. Um, by all means, give this a read, SCP-4345. Um, I... I, I do not downvote things that I don't understand. Um, and as it is, the the dialogue needs a little work, which Crashington has already sort of acknowledged and said that, you know, it's, it's something they're already aware of and going to work on. So it's, it's in the middle right now as a no vote. And hopefully one day the thing will just click. I'll, you know, it'll occur to me what exactly is going on. And then I'm going to come back and look at it again and talk about it some more. Moving on to SCP-4453, Wholesome Family Goddess by W. Maitla. Um, this would have been in the long boy slot, but since we are doing things a little differently today, um, we're going to discuss it a little bit. Um, the The crazy thing with this, with 4453, is that it feels very much uh, like 4504, which uh, was their other piece, which I covered in a dedicated episode um, and they seem to be very good at nailing this um, sort of counselor-patient dynamic. Um, and what's interesting this time is the patient in question is the Greek goddess Hera. And uh, it is sort of a like having to deal with the issues of the Greek pantheon and Zeus being, you know, a horn dog and uh having to sort of contextualize those things in a modern uh world. Uh it's it's all really uh, really well done and that's a credit to the skill of the author because this thing is very long. Um a lot of dialogue and when you do a really long dialogue heavy piece the payoff needs to be very clearly defined. It needs to be very good and make the reader feel, you know, something very strongly. And it does all of those things, um, which is 
no mean feat. You talk about build up to pay off. This is a very good example of it, of uh, the build keeps increasing. It works in um, logical, sensible moments of escalation and de-escalation. And it was uh, a real pleasure to read. The piece also took its own little twist of the people that are around Hera need to be in a happy, healthy marriage and did the exact thing that I thought found that, you know, people within the foundation employees would try to do with it. And that is to test uh, their spouse, you know, test their fidelity by trying to get them uh, on this job. And it was done in a very sternly worded open letter from a site director. Uh, you know, it was just disgusted with uh, with people for for even attempting it. Uh, you know that it's that you know if if it's that big a deal to you, get a fucking divorce lawyer. Don't uh, don't threaten the existence of the fucking universe uh, because you want to make sure your husband or your wife isn't cheating on you. Uh, it's really uh, cleverly done. Um, and that is sort of the, uh, the, the thing I keep thinking with this whole piece is very cleverly done. Now, lastly here, I've got SCP-3906 titled Blasphemous Ballot Parade by Pepper's Ghost. Welcome back, sir. Um, the last thing that, uh, Pepper's Ghost wrote, uh, that I talked about on Cafe, uh, I also really, really enjoyed that was uh, 4703 back in late September. Um, this one, the first thing when you see this thing is this wacky ACS header that not only has the containment class of Keter, but a secondary class of Newman, N-U-M-E-N, not the dude from Seinfeld, uh, and a you know risk class of critical of five and disruption class of four. Um, it was you know, it's high stakes the whole way. Um, and it's, it's honestly really cool. I like that we've got this sort of, um, inexplicable deity that is capable of terrible things. And we only sort of stumbled upon a, a method of containment through old rituals. I love the implication that the foundation is pivotal to sort of the uh, the exact way that this celebration runs out in the Philippines um, that involves the consumption of ballot, which is a uh, it's an embryonic duck egg. It's like a half formed duck. It looks disgusting. I, I if you have a chance to do a Google image search, fucking don't. Um, it is a an interesting it, the dialogue is what's really fascinating for me because it doesn't feel like, uh, uh, like English. It is, uh, and we basically say that in this, that it is, tra that it is translated and it feels like a translation, but it feels, it, it feels like a translation in an, like in a way that evokes more horror because it is, you know, this, this being that is capable of terrible things that can basically, uh, you know, cook, uh, children alive and manifest, uh, rock salt and vinegar in their lungs and having this conversation in something that doesn't really feel like native English. Um, and then we occasionally have these sort of untranslatable words where we have a couple in square brackets and the original uh, Tagalog. Uh, they're nice atmospheric touches. They do a lot for this climax. The Foundation basically elects to go the route of appeasement, which is probably sensible given we don't really have any other way to deal with it, and we basically have what looks and feels like one chance to get uh, an acceptable outcome. Um, it, it, this thing did a really good job of evoking stress and, you know, a tense interaction. Um, and I feel like part of it was because 
the English isn't a hundred percent fluent, it you know sort of the the slightly off nature of it makes you read it a little bit more closely, and from there you can uh, sort of have those stronger feelings come through. It's interesting. It's it's not something I would recommend uh, just anyone try putting their stuff in Google Translate and seeing what, what comes out, um, but it is an interesting little observation. Um, for me, Pepper's Ghost is one of the very best writers on the wiki. Um, this is a piece uh, worthy of their collection and very underloved right now at uh, plus 37. Um, I feel like this has everything you really need out of an article. Um, we've got the, the horror element is very strong. Um, we've got, you know, it's, it's short, gets to the point. I can't explain it. Um, I'm curious to see, uh, what others think about this one. Um, for me, I think this was a very, very strong article. Now we have some mailbag questions. Mini Meets says, setting aside author avatars, do you think the current state of the wiki lends itself to recurring characters, whether it be protagonist or antagonist? I think it's harder than ever. Um, it is, there's so much volume to contend with, and you have, uh, I, I think to make it work, I think a cool antagonist is more, it, it has more impact with people than a cool protagonist, because the protagonists tend to be sort of samey in a lot of articles, um, even when you have, like, ones that have really cool dialogue, if, you know, uh, it's, it's not as easy as, you know, sticking a name in, uh, you know, having a, having an antagonist rather that, um, you can use in a few articles. And if they're cool, um, you know, others will pick them up and, and, you know, maybe work with you, try to flesh them out. Um, I struggle to think of a lot of protagonists, uh, to come out recently, like somebody that I saw over and over just this year, um, and I'm struggling to come up with any. Um, the GOIs tend to give us the easiest routes to making both. Um, so that's probably, you know, if it's something somebody wants to try, I want to make a character that, you know, other people can play with. Um, I would probably, you know, try going down the GOI route and making some people that way. Because I think some of the most vibrant characters um, that we have uh, end up either initially or down the road um, becoming parts of a group of interest, if not, you know, the figurehead of one. AIS Mallard says, what's a KCON theme you would like to see or think would make for interesting content. I don't know. I've been thinking about this one a lot. Um, and I really thought we would already have the contest. But um, one uh, quite prolific author went in and uh, took a bunch of their stuff down. Partly, I think some of them are going to get rewritten. But I haven't I haven't spoken to them. Um, I don't know. Um and there's a reason I'm not on the on the uh, the contest committee. Uh, I'm not good with coming up with ideas like this. When I think of the you know thousand slots, I think of them being pivotal pieces in the wiki. Um, I think two thousand is still the most important contribution in one of those slots. Um, one thousand for its time was also I think very important um, and. So I think you want to come up with something that uh, allows the writers to try and create something pivotal, to try to create something really important, um, you know, something very epic in scope for the existence of the foundation. Um, so how do you do that? Um, I think you can, you could look at things... I mean, if you think of like 2000, um, 
you know, if you did a theme on just machines or on uh, emergencies, doomsday, whatever you want to call it, um, you can, yeah, and, and we've obviously done doomsday contest um, in the past, so that's not a great fit, but I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's all I'm trying to say is I don't I don't have uh, an answer for this interesting content. I think you want to come up with a uh, come up with a topic that gives people the opportunity to create the most interesting content. The Mighty McBee asks, aside from the classic creepypasta horror that the SCP Foundation is particularly known for, what genre or type of article would you consider to be your favorite and why? I am, so if I think through all of the things that exist outside of the main list, um, I think it's it's the joke articles, um, that they can encompass such a wide range of emotion, um, they tend to still have a very good handle on the format, but also have to hit something uh hit something fun and also unique um you can't lean too much into the main list you can't lean too much into other joke articles um but you've got to be able to find something that's that hits with a lot of people and uh so i think they're a challenge all uh, all of their own and of course you know people like reading funny things you know that's just it's a fact of life if people go into it in a good mood it's it's like with the it's like going to a stand-up comedy show you're in a good mood you know presumably hopefully you're you're in a good mood on the way there you know the comic is uh something you're excited for and so by the time the show starts you're like ready to laugh at anything like it doesn't even have to be funny um, they'll just make a little comment. You ever notice this? Like you'll, uh, hear like a stand up special where the, uh, the guy or girl just sort of makes uh, a comment and it wasn't meant to be funny, but you'll hear just a couple of people in the audience laugh. Like they thought it was going to be a setup to a joke or something. So they're already ready to enjoy things. And I think you get some of that with the joke list on the wiki. Um, maybe not to that extent, but people definitely do want your joke article to succeed. Um, it's only the ones that I think really, um, hit on old played out topics or can't get the format right. You know, they, they fail on a basic level that, you know, don't do well. I think anything that's, that's funny to enough people, um, is going to make it. And, uh, so it's it's sort of liberating in that way as well. And Rock Teeth Moth Eyes asks, any family recipes you'd like to share? Well, my dad would use the grill, and that's about it. There wasn't a lot of cooking in my family. Um, I'm kind of the first one to pick it up to any real degree, and uh, I've actually been surprised with how much fun I have with it. I will share with you um, what I consider to be the best uh, recipe I have come up with. Um, it is fairly cheap. It is not too demanding. Um, it is uh, really good. It is sweet balsamic roast chicken and vegetables. You need four uh, chicken thighs, preferably with the bone in and skin on. You need two good-sized carrots, a zucchini, a yellow squash, uh, a little container of cherry tomatoes, I believe they're 12 ounces, um, a half a cup of balsamic glaze. That's just a one-to-one -one mix of balsamic vinegar and sugar. Um, you can boil and reduce it, or um, you can buy pre-made balsamic glaze. Um, a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil and uh, kosher salt and black pepper to uh, season when you're done. So you take all your vegetables, your carrots, your zucchini, your squash, you slice them, um, into little, uh, into little coins and then quarter those, put those on a tray, like a baking sheet, um, slice the cherry tomatoes in half, put them in there too. Um, and then once you've got, those are all your vegetables, take, uh, your black pepper and, uh, either shake or grind it over those vegetables, however much you want. Um, you will take your kosher salt, um, add that to the chicken thigh, 
however much you prefer on your chicken. Um, you need a little less than you think you will if you can actually get some under the skin. Sometimes um, it's cut in a way that you can get under the skin. And if you want to put salt in there, you don't need you don't need nearly as much as you think you do. Um, so you've got a half cup of balsamic glaze. You're going to take half of that, a quarter cup, um, put that in a sandwich size Ziploc bag and put one of the chicken thighs in and mix that thing up until that thigh is good and coated and place those on the tray. Repeat that four times and whatever remaining balsamic and olive oil you've got, drizzle that over everything. Uh, 425, 35 minutes. And it was, I think it was the best thing that has ever come out of my kitchen. Uh, my wife disagrees. Um, I do ribeye steaks with, uh, uh, sauteed onions and mushrooms or uh, caramelized onions and uh, she thinks those are better I stand by this so um, the ribeyes need a precision cooker which if you're into if you're into cooking I think it is the best investment you could make um, for just turning everything up uh, another level and having just total control over exactly how uh, meat and veggies you can do all kinds of shit with a with a precision cooker um so yeah that's that's my recipe um it actually took me a while to uh find it so um glad i could uh, bring it up and share it with you so we're out week 48 and i feel like i need to say i'm sorry because this hasn't really gone the way i wanted it to it hasn't gone the way i was feeling optimistic it would go um but i gotta you know i want to get it out there and i'm gonna feel i'm gonna feel better for having something out there than nothing um so you know to the authors that you know were maybe expecting the full recap treatment i apologize um i don't yet know how i'm gonna you know close out this year um but i've got a couple more days in this week I'm going to try some new things. I have an idea that I think I'm going to play with, if not tonight, then tomorrow morning. And we're going to roll that out. It's it's the uh, podcast equivalent of a cold post. We're going to fucking see what it does, hell or high water. Just toss it out there and, and do it. So um, until then, thank you very much for all of your support. Um, over the last year, um, you guys have, uh, meant more to me than, you know, so I will see you soon until then. Keep reading, keep writing. And I'll see you on the other side.